You guys came back for the second, so that's a good sign. So, all right. Um, first of all, how many people do we recognize in this uh, in this uh, front slide right here? <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay. Wait. 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 Okay. There we go. So yeah, John Carmen, right? Who else have we got? Okay. Actually, this is not the oldest one, but and then do we recognize? Um, and, and oh yeah, there we go, right there. And Lynn Mohart, right there. So yeah. <laughs> And no, this is not me, and uh, this is uh, not anybody in O&M right now either. Yeah, those are uh, golfers. Um, had a I mean, there's a couple of photos of that. There one of them is there's a whole board that they're all just pegged up there. Uh, they had a lot of golfers, but anyway. Okay, so you know when I did the first part, we covered the our, our prior uh, uh, agencies, right? And then since United Water was formed, it's kind of interesting, but there was nothing for me to go back to. There, there's no book, there's no write-up really of United Water's history. And so actually I had to start digging through old newspaper articles, all of our old board minutes. And, and then I relied on also, um, we used to sit up there, uh, Craig and I used to sit up there with John Dickinson, who told us all these stories. And uh, of course, that was 15 years ago, and I've forgotten most of them. But um, but either way, so so we also did, uh, you know, I also did uh, pull from some of the old stories also. So anyway, but I just want to bring up. I probably only I, I know I did. I only touch. I'm only touching the surface of everything that went on during this period of time because there was so much going on at this time. So let's go. And first of all, I would like to explain a couple of different things so that you'll understand, you know, kind of our fights and everything that we went through in the future here. And, and one of them is our water rights. So we get a water right from the State Water Resources Control Board, and it's an appropriative right. And then that's a right for us to use that water. And it's very important that you get that. Without that, you can't take water off the river. You cannot use the water. And, and so you have to go to the board. They have to you have to file for an application and, and then get a permit, and then they'll give you a water right eventually. A um, couple of things regarding a water right is first in time is first in right, meaning if you get in there and you apply for it, that means you are first in right. But as you'll find out, that doesn't always happen. Um, also, you have to use it or you'll lose it. And... Um, and also, it's uh, not based on land ownership. So back when we were the Santa Clara uh, Water Conservation District, we actually did not have a water right. We were diverting and putting water into the ground. And from what we could understand, or what I can understand, is that we were advised by a lawyer in the 1930s saying we didn't need to do that. We did not need a water right, um, which was very interesting. Um, probably would have been better if we had filed one right off the get-go. The other thing that I'd like to bring up, and this ties more into John Linquist's uh, presentation, is we have three major water districts within this area, and they include the Casitas Municipal Water District, and the geology really to, is kind of neat. Our three different water districts have three different kind of geologies and the ways to actually to, to be able to get this water. And Casitas is in the mountains, but they have very little groundwater basins, but they also ha have a fair amount of uh, rainfall. So therefore building a dam made sense and building one as big as you can to hold as much water back to, to distribute that over the drought periods. Cayegas, on the other hand, doesn't have many mountains in its area. It has no ability to build big dams because of that. And also there isn't much runoff. They also didn't have ground, very many groundwater basins, at least in, in this portion of it. There are a few groundwater basins in here. So therefore, they had to rely, they have to rely on others, outside sources for their water. And then the United Water Conservation District actually has the best of both worlds. We got, we got the mountains, we got the rainfall, so we have places to put dams, but then we got these massive groundwater basins that were able to store that water very cheaply compared to building other dams. So we had the best of both worlds. And that's the reason why, you know, when we talked about a few weeks ago when I was talking about it, 
people are trying to get this water is because we were in a very favorable area for water. Okay, so where we left off last time was we went through a very wet period in here. So this is the rainfall right here. These are 10 year, this is the 10 year average right here of rainfall. So whenever it was higher, that means a lot of, that means it's a wet period. Whenever it's dropping, that means it's a dry period, right? And so we were in a very wet period. Uh, water resources was a little bit less of a concern at that time, but what was a concern was flood protection. We had lost uh, uh, several bridges at that time. And so the formation of the Ventura County Flood Control District was formed. And we had, uh, we were in zone two and zone three was actually part of the Cayugas system. Um, and as a result of that, uh, that formation, they did a water study for flood protection and for water uh, resources. And then they concluded that if we if they took water from our area up in the Sespe and brought it over to their area in zone three, that that would be a good use of water resources. That of course made United, our, our predecessor agency very concerned. And as a result, we ended up hiring Harold Conklin to do a water study to figure out what we need to do. And if you remember his name from last time, he was the one who worked for the State Water Resource Control Board and designed our percolation test when we we're fighting against um, William Mulholland uh, regarding St. Francis Dam. And so he, that was 20 years prior. He now owned his own uh, a consulting firm. And so we hired him because he was familiar with the area and also he was the, the, uh, the state engineer for the State Water Resource Control Board. Um, <clears throat> so he performed a study and he concluded, A, that we were, even after this wet period, the estimated overdraft was around 30,000 acre feet in the Oxnard Plain. That number over time has just roughly, has always been there. It's, it's either 20 to 30 to 40,000 uh, acre feet. It's quite amazing. Um, but one of the concerns was, is water levels did not recover after that wet period. They noticed that, that, uh, Water levels in the 1930s after the first wet period were higher than what they were this time. And they said, okay, we got a problem here. We are definitely using more and we're gonna, we're gonna have problems in the future. And his third suggestion was file our water rights now because nobody had done that. The, the so far zone three didn't do it and Cayugas had not done it. So he said, get them in. That was the first order of business. I think it was literally the next board meeting we had filed our water rights. And we filed, we filed big. Um, we filed for about 2 million acre feet total. <laughs> and to understand our, 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 you know, the most we've ever gotten, I think is roughly about 1 million acre feet. And that was in 2000 or 1998. So it, it was, uh, but what we were told is you can always ask for more water. I mean, you can always ask for less water. Once you file, you can never ask for more water. So therefore you file big and then you tone it down. And so we did. And then of course that changed into several different water rights applications that we sent in and they modified those. And each one of these for, were for different creeks and for agriculture municipal uh, purposes. So our first plans um, were potentially build a uh, dam at Blue Point that's right above uh, Lake Piru build one at Santa Felicia Dam, where we have one now, build a, or, or go for the water right that we already had a diversion on Piru Creek, and we wanted to get a water right for that, build a dam on Cold Springs up in the Sespe Creek, and this one on our stand was 400,000 acre feet, um, which there isn't that much watershed above there, so I don't, I don't understand what their thinking was right there, build a Hamel Dam, and then also Topo Topo Dam, in, in all in the Sespe. And of course, uh, get our water rights for Satakoi diversion and uh, at a diversion rate of 375 cubic feet per second, which is current, our current rate. So the total surface storage was totaled about 780,000 acre feet. So we toned it down a little. Um, but right after that, right after we filed ours, uh, zone three filed for a water right. And 
And they ended up uh, shortly after gave it to Cayegas, the the water the the application and their right to or the right for that application. And what they had wanted was a dam on Coal Springs, hundred thousand acre feet, uh, Coal Trail uh, Dam, Tar Creek diversion, where what they were doing is they were building a diversion dam pretty high up in the Sespe right here, and then. They were going to have a conduit and an inverted siphon all the way right under the Santa Clara River, all the way over to near Moore Park and build a 300 acre foot uh, offsite uh, dam in, at Tierra Rajada. So big project. The idea there was is then they were going to be able to distribute water to, to uh, Conejo Valley, Simi Valley, and then all throughout this district or throughout this area in here and actually on down to Oxnard. So big plans, everyone had big plans at this time. Um, they had a total surface storage of about 560,000 acre feet. So since we were first in time, we started right away uh, trying to build a dam and the time was good. Um, right then uh, it was during a drought and here's, you know, newspaper articles, another Oxnard area well reveals salt intrusion, salt water found in Oxnard beach wells. So salt water was finally being documented coming into our system. This is in the late 1940s. And, and the city of Oxnard actually started becoming very concerned on this because their water levels were dropping. They were below, at this time, they were pumping well below sea level and they were pumping along fairly near to the coast. And so they ended up supporting us to, the problem was that with our, our prior water district is we couldn't uh, um, get bonds to build big projects. So we had to reformulate into another water district, into United Water Conservation District. So we did that, and, but it had to go to the vote of the people uh, within our district. And so, is it was interesting. I, all there's a whole bunch of articles of obviously us promoting the the vote for us to become a uh, United Water Conservation District, and and you can see you know these are the facts. Well, actually, let me back up on that one. I I just like this image right here of of do you want this you know dry water or do you want this? You know, it's like either that or that. Vote for United Water and Conservation District. So it was great. Um, well, it turned out. It, we did well on this one. Um, although it was a really light turnout, they said it was one of the lowest turnouts in, in voting as a special election. Um, we still won a, about a four to one vote of they supported United Water to become a water conservation district. And so we immediately, the first order of business was to hire a general manager. And we hired uh, none other than Julian Hines, who who was living, actually he became our general manager and chief engineer. So that's kind of, you know, Mauricio and Miriam combined, I think, right? And uh, and never mind that I think it was $6,000 per year, something like that. Anyway, good deal. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Jul Julian Hines was well known. He was, he was the manager for uh, Metropolitan Water District uh, general manager for Metropolitan Water District for about 10 years. And he has a very large uh, pumping plant named after him on the Colorado, uh, pumping water from the Colorado River to into Metz area. It's called the Julian Hines uh, um, pumping plant. And anyway, he was, he actually, uh, he had to retire from Met because he had turned 70. And he decided to go to live in Santa Paula and retire. But then all of a sudden we found him and he decided, well, he'll take the take us on as a project, I guess. And anyway, so it was good to have him. He was a well-recognized uh, person in this area. And frozen. It's frozen. It's Yeah. yeah. What much, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
He's retired as supplemental income, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, so so immediately right afterwards, we started uh, geotechnical investigations looking for dam sites, the appropriate dam sites in both Sespe and Piru Creeks. Um, it's and, and if you're interested, there's a whole series of pictures up here of these investigations of people going up into the Sespe uh, and drilling and, and, and lots of reports and everything else. So every time when I talk about one of these dams, there's reports behind it. There's analysis behind it of what its yields will be. This right here, this long one right here is a, a yield analysis is obviously before Excel, but you'll see it's monthly monthly for many, many years of how much water goes into each basin and they and they transfer it and then they look at what the yields were for each project. So substantial amount of work went into each one of these that I'm mentioning right here. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, so what we had proposed was uh, we ended up after all the investigations and what we thought was a reasonable project to, to start building was uh, Santa Felicia Dam and a dam on Topo Topo, uh, which is right up here in the Sespe, and then improvements to the Satakoi diversion. Um, <clears throat> and still, we were still in a drought, so still times were very favorable to get a project like this through. People found the need, you know, with with you know, headlines like this saying salt water pouring into the Oxnard Plain, you know, that obviously made people very interested in, in what we were doing. Um, water levels dropping, pump lifts high, drop as water table, city, city water wells below sea level right here. Anyway, uh, there's numerous, many, many articles regarding all this during this period of time because it was a big deal. Um, <clears throat> and so we proposed an $18 million bond to build both Sespe and, um, and Piru and, and the, the improvements. And again, I don't know, does that translate to a, what a dam would cost now? I don't know. It seems pretty cheap. But um, so lots of PR, vote yes, vote yes. So this one I like. This is a message from your Oxnard new car dealer. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and then it lists all the car dealers in support of this. It's like, Maybe car dealers were viewed differently back then. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but vote yes for water. Yes. Anyway, um, lots of lots of uh, PR, lots of support to try to get this bond through that we tried to get through, and and so it finally went on December sixteenth. Uh, uh, vote no actually was very interesting. Uh, Charles Outlin, who was a uh, resident historian in this area and a very well known person said no, uh, a few others did too. And, and um, so there wasn't entire support for this, for this project. And what happened was, unfortunately we needed a two thirds majority to, to pass the bond. We got about a 50, 50 uh, uh, votes. And so therefore it did not pass. So we took it back and said, and actually uh, started looking at, so what we did was we, Actually, they started looking at focus groups and they said what went wrong and they figured out that a it was a little bit too expensive and also the people down in the Oxnard Plain, they didn't feel like they were benefiting enough. So they redeveloped a, a project and they said, let's take away Topo Topo. But then also let's let's look at uh, adding a whole delivery system out to the Pleasant Valley area and put in the El Rio spreading grounds and OH delivery system. And this time, now with the dam, with these improvements, it's probably starting to look pretty familiar to you. Um, again, this time is only 10, almost $11 million. And went to the vote of the people again. And, and the fate of the district rests on this bond vote. So yeah, a lot of things are going on. Um, a future of 75,000 people rest on the water bond. And we ended up passing. Um, so the city, uh, again, voted overwhelmingly for it because we had lots of improvements for Oxnard. But overall, we had 6,000 yeses, 2,800 noes. So we had a two-thirds majority, and, and it passed. Um, and so during the water rights to, to get this, uh, it was kind of interesting is, you know, uh, when the State Water Resource Control Board looks at giving a water right, they have to look at all beneficial uses. And, and one of them is they always engage fish and game back then. And so when they did engage fish and game back then, 
they said, do we need, you know, they asked questions of, do we need a fish passage system? Do we need to provide bad pie slows and that sort of thing? And, and their recommend, well, it was kind of interesting it, is that this is the district biologist, district fisheries biologist, and but where he said, these two streams are not of importance to migratory fish and therefore no structure such as fish ladder would be required. So if you're ever wondering why we don't have a, a fish passage system on our dam, it was because back then they didn't feel it was needed. Um, but they also felt that these dams would actually provide a net benefit. And of course, their, their interest was predominantly for, for selling licenses so people could go out and fish. And they wanted to get as many fish in the water as they could. So they knew that you know, dams and lakes provide lots of good fishing, lots of good licenses, and they can keep, keep that going on. So, um, so anyway, that, that was part of, the, part of the history there. But, so we did the improvements, we built them, we built an improved intake at the Freeman Diversion, we built the El Rio spreading grounds with the, uh, the wells, delivery to Oxnard uh, being built right in here. And then of course the, the, the Santa Felicia Dam, which uh, Miriam had talked about the history of building that last time. Um, <clears throat> just three years later, uh, this, this is just proof you can find anything on the internet. Um, and uh, just three years later, here's here's a video of of uh, after the dam was built. Here's a video of, and it became clear that the cool kids hung out in Piru. Yeah. <laughs> it actually had some water in it, enough for water skiing. And uh, anyway, I, I just thought this video was kind of funny to see. That one guy was. <laughs> that guy was predominantly worried about smoking his pipe. <laughs> there he is. I'm like, Darn it. Yeah. <laughs> and there's the bathrooms back then. Um, I think they've improved. So anyway, um, yeah, kind of a fun little video. But that was just three years after the Santa Felicia Dam was built in 19. Uh, uh, 58, I think this film was. So, a couple things. Uh, uh, actually, of interest, this was a funny, kind of funny article I found. Uh, this is uh, Eugene Kimball. He was our board chairman for quite a long time, actually, at the beginning when United Water uh, Contrib Dis Conservation District was formed. And this this person right here is Roy Wilson. He's a well-known architect in, in uh, Santa Paula. He built the Limonera building amongst uh, many of the well-known houses there. And, 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 and he went and proposed, he said, you know, now that you built the dam, he went and proposed these 30 foot tall, 60 foot long brontosauruses at the entrance of, of, uh, of, of the lake. And, and just from looking at Kimball's uh, face, <laughs> I don't think, <laughs> I, you knew it wasn't gonna pass. <laughs> And I had to look it up and, and uh, you know, I, I thought that maybe, well, maybe this was Flintstones inspired, but Flintstones came about 10 years afterwards. So maybe, you know, uh, maybe uh, um, um, uh, Roy, Roy Wilson was just a little ahead of his time. I don't know. Oh, but then, and, and this one's for Clayton right here. This is 1961. So we already had a fairly full lake before. And I, I just want to show you how low the hydrologists used to take the water, all right? <laughs> this, <laughs> they talked about they had to move all the, the bass and carp out of there. They moved thousands of pounds of bass and carp because they were because they took it so low and they were all dying. So they had to they actually took them down to the uh the hatchery and, and kept them alive there until it rained again and brought them back. So. Yeah, this is the old intake, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. And that's, well, I once saw a picture of a pump right here where they actually were pumping it in. I mean, that's how, that's how low it got. Anyway. Um. <clears throat> 
So when we after we finished the dam, uh, Julian Hines retired. He said that that's I was here for, to build the dam, and then he retired. And um, William Price became our new uh, general manager at that time. Uh, so let's see. So the the what happened now was we had just built the dam. We didn't get a dam on the Sespe. The voters did not approve that. Hiegas, of course, was waiting in the wings, going. You know, now's our chance. United obviously can't build a dam in the Sespe, so they challenged our water right and said, "We now it's our turn to go build a dam on the Sespe," and we went through a fight uh, with them, and and we had 22 days of testimony up at the the State Water Resource Control Board, and so it was just you know one suit after another coming in there and talking about how we needed the water and and they would talk about how they needed the water at the end though we lost um it said and 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 here's here's the reason being is that the highlight it says provide provide no water uh for Cayugas district and might we might as well condemn that portion of Ventura County to economic stagnation and therefore, even they, though they were a junior in water rights, they gave it to them. They said, okay, you guys can go ahead and build that. Um, so basically, we had just lost Sespe Creek. And Sespe Creek is about 60% of all of our water, right? So we had just lost more than half of our water at that time. So big deal um, back then. But <clears throat> a couple things happened. And of course, United Water, they gave us our water right, final water right for Santa Felicia Dam and the Satakoy Diversion, and of course, our Piru Diversion there too. Um, <clears throat> but something happened in between there, or just a couple of years after that, is that Cayugas signed on to the uh, to Met to be able and and to build a project to, to get water from Met through the Santa Susana Tunnel. Um, <clears throat> And then also Met just agreed to help or, or uh, agreed with the Feather River project, which is also known as State Water uh, Project from DWR, which is part of Oroville, right? So those two things went on. So before the board agreed to them to, to harvest water off the Sespe because they had no other alternative, right? So as soon as they signed up and started uh, signed up with Met, we appealed. We appealed to the uh, to the State Water Resource Control Board, and when we did, we had another 23 days of hearings up at the State Water Resource Control Board. And this is um, what five years later, actually, than than the first one. And this, this kind of interesting. This photo, there was a whole series of them taken, and what they were doing is they were trying to study their faces and their reactions to certain things. So they were actually taking a whole bunch of photos and looking at them, going, "Okay, they're they're swaying, they're not, or whatever." So this is one of those. This is actually during the hearing, and they were actually listening. And and I forget who they all are, but uh, there's some are a couple are state water resource control board, and others are lawyers. Um, <clears throat> and after that. Uh, United wins actually this time around because they said they found, you know, Met Met can supply Cayegas, they're okay. Uh, they're going to get Feather River project, and we also showed that we still need it here. We were in overdraft, and we we had other groundwater studies to show that. So finally, we won, and and we went back to designing uh, dams again, and this time. Actually, what we were doing is we we're considering two dams, Cold Springs and Topo Topo, but ended up we we and we joined with the Bureau of Reclama Reclamation this time around to build uh, to build the to build these dams. Um, we ended up trying to push through Topo Topo first because um, we knew it was going to be a heavy lift. Here's the artist renderings of what they were going to look like in the Sespe. Here's Topo Topo right here. Um, I think this is Topo Topo Bluffs right here. I, I don't know. Anyway, so, and then, uh, and here's Cold Springs right here, uh, what they were going to look like. And timing again was right. It, it was seawater. Here, ocean water ruins 50 wells on the Oxnard Plain. Seawater running, 
ruining local wells. You know, it was it, the need was obvious that we needed this dam. Um, but and we pushed through. We we had one tour after another to go up to the sites. I mean, this is just a handful of them. And, and actually, the one I find kind of find funny is they the first uh, feminine. Uh, they brought a, a group of women. And and the newspapers concluded that that the women had a good understanding of of the need for water resources in the county. <laughs> and it was, it was, anyway, I just quite quite odd. Uh, I, I found that one, but anyway, we brought up tons of tours, lots of uh, lots of uh, um, uh, lots of things going on. But but this time the fight wasn't so much with others. And it, and it wasn't about the, the need for the project as much, but there was a new something new coming up and there was an environmental movement that we had not seen in any other previous time. And this time it was the condor. The condor became the, the uh, species of, well, it was an endangered species, although this is before the Endangered Species Act. And we have, there's probably 200 articles going back and forth about uh, the condor versus uh, uh, water and the water needs of the people here. And <clears throat> and it was mostly, uh, it started out with the Sierra Club. Sierra Club had just finished uh, fighting off, um, was a dinosaur in the Colorado, the Dinosaur National Monument uh, uh, dam that was going to be in there. Um, they had just finished, uh, they were fighting off different dams uh, in different areas. They actually joined in on this one, but the Audubon Society definitely was uh, part of that, uh, of going against the dam here in the, at Topo Topo. Um, this is an interesting drawing, water, water everywhere, not, in, not a drop. And this is United Water Conservation District. And you can see the, the bird is hanging over his neck. <laughs> Uh, night and and they're saying 90 million on that one is actually I think it was cheaper than that. It ended up like 60 million. So um, again, we pushed uh, very hard to get this dam through. Here's organizations that say yes on the CESPI, and and the list was substantial. Um, lots of articles going back and forth. CESPI finally rejected. They, we went to the vote of the people again. We lost by 40 votes. This is a vote of our entire district, and it was only 40 votes. Otherwise, we would have had a dam built up on Topo Topo. Um, being that close, and you know how close votes, you know, when votes get close, you know what happens. You start claiming uh, hanging chads and things like that. Uh, it was no different for us. It was... Uh, we demanded a recount, and so we actually brought it in, fully recounted. This is a, here's a survival instinct, Sespe Dam vote recount. Sespe wow. <laughs> um, election unchanged, but it did change from 40 down to 32. So literally 32, if 32 people, well, actually more than half, if 16, 17 people voted the other way, we would have had a dam on, on we would have had Topo Topo. Um, whether it's a good thing, bad thing, you know, that's, you know, for all of us to, you know, ponder. So as a result, all these attempts were attempts at building dams from others. They all failed, fortunately. And then, of course, we got one dam in, the green dam here, meaning Santa Felicia Dam. Um, we also got, you know, improved headworks. We went from uh, a much smaller diversion dam to a much larger one. We're actually able to take 375 cubic feet per second in the 1950s and through the 1980s. But something else was going on then. And, and I want to show you a picture. Those who are familiar with going out to the Freeman diversion, if you recognize this gate right here is this gate right here, right? You look, this is the river just coming in to the diversion intake, right? So when you drive the S turn right here going to the Freeman Diversion, if you look at the river, it's way over there and it's also about 20 feet down, right? So the river used to be, um, no, it's, oh, there it is. Anyway, so the river used to be much higher and what was going on, and this was started really in the 50s, um, is 
they used to go out, this is the 118 bridge right here. They used to go out and dig these huge holes, pull all the gravel out of it uh, to build, uh, to build well roadways and everything else to build, help build the county. And then they would let the big storms come in and fill this in, and then they'd dig it back out again. What that was doing is is causing the riverbed to drop further and further down. So you can kind of see where that hole was. You can see where the river was right there, right? So let's back it up. And so again, the, the 118 is going to remain right there, but then this hole goes all the way to here. So here again, you know, you look at it, it went out at least halfway into the river right there. So, and there were other gravel mines further downstream, actually, downstream on the bottom, back side of the 118. So that was dropping the riverbed. It was actually undermining all the bridges. And they knew it was actually going to go all the way up to Santa Paula and start undermining that whole system in there, too. It was running itself up there. Um, that was becoming a problem for United. We had to keep chasing that water further and further up. As a result, ended up in about a 20-foot drop in the riverbed. Also, 1970s, the State Water Resource Control Board came down, and they were concerned because we had ongoing seawater intrusion in this area. They knew that we're in overdraft, we had seawater intrusion, and as a result of their investigation, they threatened to adjudicate the Oxnard Plain. So they were going to come down if we didn't do anything about it. So we got together with a lot of people. They were projecting, actually, in, by the year 2000, uh, uh, the intrusion would have gone up to near the 101 right here. Um, and actually, it's darn near to almost right underneath our office now. And so anyway, we got together uh, with the county, uh, State Water Resource Control Board, the uh, DWR, and actually Fish and Game uh, worked with us too to develop a solution so that we wouldn't get adjudicated. And the, and the solution was three points. It was the creation of the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. It was the Seawater Intrusion and Abatement Project, which is the Freeman Diversion. And it was the creation of the PTP, the Pumping Trough Pipeline, to get water further down into the Oxnard Plain right here to help prevent uh, lower water levels in this area. We did that. Uh, um, and during that time, in order to do that, we needed to get uh, another water right, an increased water right, because the Freeman diversion actually could be able to divert more than what it had in the past. So we went for a permit. Um, Fish and Game at that time protested it, and they said we that they had some concerns regarding steelhead trout this time. Um, and so what they wanted was a two-year study. They, they, they wanted a two-year study to figure out, are there still steelhead in this, in this river system or not? And so for, for two years, they went out and, and netted. This is the CESPI right here and also at the Freeman Diversion and other places looking for, for steelhead to find out, is there still a viable population here or not? They found, I think, two or three adults during this two-year period and so they concluded that there were still a remnant steelhead population, and therefore they wanted us to put in fish passage system, and they wanted us to provide bypass flows. And so we did that, actually. Their first recommendation was putting in the exact same one that we actually have at the Freeman Diversion today. So we built the Freeman Diversion in 1990, much bigger than, than you know, this is, doesn't look anything like it now. We had to scrape all this out and to build this whole project right here is a much bigger project than what it looks like, you know, when you go out there today. Um, well, here's the older picture. You recognize these two people right here, the signing of a, the, the opening of the Freeman diversion of when they started. Um, so anyway, we built the Freeman diversion. Um, we had extreme success you know we we've uh we built it in the drought of 1990 and i think we finished it and about two months later miracle march happened and miracle march was the first big storm we had after that drought and then we went into probably the wettest uh decade on record that we've ever had so the freeman diversion paid off um also, what happened this is another. This is the same photo that I showed. I just wanted to show it because we had finished paying off the uh, 
Santa Felicia Dam loan. This was 1994, actually. So we cleared that one. Um, so long story short in all of this is we, we've had seawater intrusion from for a long time now. 1960s, we're looking at seawater intrusion coming into this area in here, and we're looking at it coming into this area right in here. This is an upper aquifer system. 75, 79, pretty much hadn't changed much, you know. Um, and again, 95 to 99 um, hasn't changed much. So, so long story short is, and this is kind of, kind of currently where we think it is at, um, probably a little further now because that's it's you know been a little bit of a drought since. Um, but long story short is, you know, all of our activities have helped keep it at bay, the seawater intrusion, and it's done a good job doing that. Um, do we need more? Yes, because we can't have, you know, we can't have this advance more. Um, and I think I'm going to end with this slide right here, which is always one of my favorites. This is when we built the Freeman diversion, we had an incredible amount of average, our average diversions back then through 2011 was about 75,000 acre feet. This red line are, are chloride levels along the, in one of our monitoring wells. This is you know, getting up there, whatever it is, seven, 8,000 milligrams uh, per liter of, of chlorides, which is getting close to seawater, right, John? And, and then, you know, with all of our spreading, you can actually see chloride levels drop. And, you know, thanks to, thanks to all this water we've been putting into the ground, we saw it drop again. But now our average diversions have been lowered substantially mostly due to the drought, but also due to the environmental bypass flows, additional flows that we can't divert. And as a result, we're watching chloride levels, you know, climb again. And, you know, this year, of course, we've now spread, what, 110, about 110,000 acre feet, you know, where, where, so that equals to probably just about all these years combined, you know, almost. Um, so we're, we're doing, really, really well, we likely will be seeing that reverse itself. But uh, just to end it is that, you know, obviously what we do is very, very important for this area. You know, we've had lots and lots of fights, um, but we've always come out, you know, winning on on, on them. And, and we've always, you know, because what we do here is, well, it's something we have to do. We have to, we have to be successful. We have no choice. You know, too many people rely on it. So um, with that, any questions? I think that's the next slide, yeah. No? Yeah, go for it. Upstream of the dam? No. No, I, I, I didn't see that one. They were going to do our dam, you know, right? They, they had an interest in, in hooking up to our dam at one point, but that's the reason why we put in our power plant, right? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, my understanding is, yeah, we were concerned that, because uh, I think it was Carter who said, okay, uh, if there's a place that people can build dams, uh, or build uh, power plants, and it's being wasted right now. Other outside sources, outside people can actually come in and start building those um, power plants. We didn't want that to happen here, right? We didn't want somebody coming in and building it and then potentially telling us how to release water. Um, so we built our own, and that, that was our interest. It really wasn't a uh, so much of, yeah, this is going to be, you know, a, a moneymaker or anything, right? Because it really isn't. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're I think we're in it right now. Um yeah. Well we'll talk about that one in ten years, Brom. <laughs> and how we won. And how we won. <laughs>
Nothing else? All right. Thank you. Thank you.